Testing. Sure. Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, no, I'm fine. I'm going to need to check my uh, cheat sheet over here as well. So I'll be back here changing slides. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Can all you guys hear me? All right. OK. So first, I want to do a quick survey here. I, I, this is my first boot camp. I know it's the first boot camp in general, but it's my first time to come back and talk for an hour about corporate finance. So first off, uh, how many first years do we have? Ooh. Everyone. OK. How many people are interested in corporate finance? How about, how about if you had to choose right now between investment banking and corporate finance, who would choose corporate finance? Wow. All right. Um, what I want to do today is, uh, is talk a little bit, um, let's see here, huh. is to talk about my personal background and my career progression at Amazon. And then, and then talk about corporate finance as I understand it in general, not just as at Amazon. And then dive into a little bit of specifics about Amazon, the specifics about corporate finance at Amazon. And finally talk about the long-term career path and just finance in general. Um, I have to say that I won't be able to talk about very, very specific details. If you want to ask me things like how many Kindle devices have we sold, I don't know. I actually don't know. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to dive into a lot of the details. What I do want to do is, is, is talk uh, in generali generalities about um, the actual experiences and a lot of things that I've learned at Tepper that I can apply at Amazon. So, so first off, um, ish, actually walk through a little bit of my career. But I think the most important thing to call out is that where I was you. It was, I, it was, I only graduated from Tepper four years ago. Um, so six years ago, I was in your, in your shoes. 
and I had just joined, I was an engineer, didn't know much about corporate finance. When people said, when people talked about restructuring, I didn't know if they were talking about organizational restructuring or restructuring of the balance sheet. It, to me, it, it was this big blur, and it took me a while to figure it all out. But what I want to emphasize is, is that um, Tepper gave me the tools to actually become a, quite a successful person at, at Amazon. And first off, I, uh, I interned at Amazon in 2005. Um, I was in the, uh, the, the vendor finance, it was, it was managing the, uh, the vendor relationships for uh, the media products. And, uh, and that was in 2005. And my intern project at the time was looking at uh, returnable vendor contracts. So I don't know if th the books industry is very specific, but roughly about 35% of all books that you see at a bricks and mortar bookstore actually get returned to the publisher. They just sit there, collect dust, never sell, and they get returned. And so managing the amount of returns and the cost is one of the most important things for book resellers to, for managing their profitability. So what Amazon did is Amazon went out to a lot of publishers and said, look, we want to switch to a contract where we promise we'll never ever return anything. We know that we, have, we don't have thousands and thousands of retail outlets. We have centralized fulfillment centers where we store our inventory. And we can do a much better job of managing inventory than, than a normal uh, bookseller. So uh, we think that you know, if you give us a discount, We'll promise never to return any books to you. So my intern analysis was, was looking at those contracts and for Amazon. I mean, if we executed poorly, we would get very, very little discount and then have a whole bunch of crap inventory and overstock and problems. Um, so that's what I did as an intern. One, one of the things I wanted to call out is even as an intern, uh, I, as an aside project, sort of got involved in this thing about selection and. The analysis at the time was, well, how deep in the tail should we go uh, when we look at, at, at our books catalog? You know, right now we have thousands and thousands and thousands of, of SKUs within the books catalog, but really how deep should we go? And uh, this was just a side project. And even though it wasn't even the focus of my internship, I was in a meeting uh, in Jeff, with Jeff Bezos talking about, you know, how deep in the tail we should go. What's exciting about it, and one of the things that I want to call out is, is that finance is at the cusp of all those analysis at Amazon and at most companies. And finance really drives and is, has a seat at the table. And it was very exciting as an intern to be even involved in those conversations because Amazon values the opinion of finance when, the, when finance can contribute something. So um, what I decided to do after that um, Obviously, Amazon was a great experience for me, and so I wanted to go back and, uh, and, and go back full time. One of the things that I wanted to call out here is, is that, um, you know, the main reason that I've stayed at Amazon so long, I mean, so long it's only four years, but the main reason that I've stayed is that uh, um, finance is very powerful at Amazon. I mean, it's a very exciting place. It's intellectually stimulating. But one of the things that I wanted to call out, and I think this is, a, this is more general than just Amazon, is that at companies with, with low margins, and Amazon has small margins compared to a lot of other companies, is incredibly powerful. And the reason is because the margins are so small. You have to understand your cost structure, and you have to understand where you're generating your revenue, and you have to understand it very well in order to manage in order to navigate at those, at those low margins. You could make a mistake, and you could go negative margin very quickly. And in order to increase your margins, you can't just make a, some sort of you know, snap decision, and all of a sudden you go from 5% margins to 15% margins to 25% margins. You, you can't do that. We work really hard. I lose lots of hair. And we go from you know something we get five points of margin or something. But th those are the kind of companies where corporate finance is incredibly powerful. Um, and so for me, it's exciting every day to go to work and, and to see that what I'm doing in finance is really impacting and driving the business. Um, feel free to ask any questions. Jump in anytime. So just in general, um, this, this largely mimics the organizational structure at Amazon, but this is, this is much more general than just Amazon. When we talk about corporate finance, 
oh, it hasn't changed. Hmm. When we talk about corporate we're talking about mostly about business support. Um, business support is probably 80% of all the jobs in corporate finance. And so what that means is, is that you're on the front line. The person you spend the most time with isn't, isn't another finance person or isn't accounting or isn't you know, some sort of specialty person. It's actually the person running the business. And so you're required to really understand the business. I mean, the most important skills to have are general management skills, uh, you know, all the different classes that you can take here at Tepper, learning about uh, you know, pricing, learning about operations, learning about things, because that's how you provide strong finance support for the business. And then there's something that we, we call FP&A, Financial Planning and Analysis. Right here, this says corporate, but there's actually very many different flavors of FP&A. But these are essentially groups that sit very, very close to the very senior leaders, whether it's the CFO or CEO or the actual senior vice presidents that own entire business groups. And they're responsible for, for sort of rolling up all the different business groups and making sense of all these moving parts. Next, and I think what, what a lot of attention gets at business school is the specialty functions, especially treasury and investor relations. But these are fields where actually you have years and years and years of experience. You know how to deal with investment banking. You know how to deal with uh, managing the balance sheet, managing the capital structure. For, for corporate controllers, you know the SEC requirements. You know all the accounting rules. You know how to implement this in, in, in within a variety of different companies. And, and, but these are, very, these are very specialty fields. And, and typically, people um, actually things like pr professional accounting firms from investment, bank, from investment banking companies. They're not, um, they're not things that you would sort of, uh, of, of is something that I would, would rotate into, per se, unless I really wanted to change my focus. Um, and then finally, at the bottom, I'm throwing in a bunch of uh, other possibilities. And what I mean by other possibilities means, depending on the company, these functions roll into finance or they don't roll into finance. But they're, they're a key part, and finance is typically pretty close. So first off, finance operations. So finance operations are things like making sure that you can collect your receivables, making sure that you can pay your, your account payables, making sure that you're watching the transactions of the money and making sure that you have the processes to manage the flow of money for everyday transactions. Things like tax, internal audit, uh, benchmarking, um, long-term capacity planning. All these things uh, tie in very closely to what finance is doing, but are, but are specialty fields in and of themselves, and sometimes can roll into finance and sometimes roll into the business. So let's see here. OK. So control support. What does that really mean? Um, so first off, finance, especially when you're business support, you're, you're the protector of the financial performance of the company, right? And you're there to make sure that you understand and fully drive the, the revenue rec generation process, the expense control and approval process. Now, this is pretty close to controllership and accounting. However, um, if you don't understand and, uh, and can validate and ensure that the numbers are right, all you're talking about after that is just hunches and assumptions, and, and it's very hard to have meaningful analysis if you can all that stuff is right. Um, so I spend a lot of my time making sure that our financial reporting accruals and metrics are accurate. Um, now, I'm not like an SDE, and I'm not, I don't go into, you know, make sure that when someone buys something on the website that the transaction flows through. I mean, there, there's specialty teams that do that. However, when I roll up all my numbers, um, we're going to have to make, we're going to have to make assumptions on certain things when we look at um, the actual financial performance. So a good example would be uh, something like uh, inventory valuation. So Amazon and millions of dollars of inventory. Uh, and what we do is, is we want to make sure that the inventory, when we close our books, is, is, is actually of the value that we're sta stating. We need to market to the market value. Um, and that's, that's, a hard, that's a hard thing to do. We have millions and millions and millions of different product. 
They have m m like lots of different values. Some things we've had for a day, some things we've had for a year, some things are brand new, some things have been in the market for a long time. And so we have to go through and say, well, do these inventory numbers really make sense? And how do we test that? How do we validate that? What kind of recovery do we expect if we think the inventory is actually not very good? What kind of recovery do we think we're going to get? We could mark it down and actually still make a profit on it, or we might mark it down and, and, and lose 5%, or we might lose 10%. How do we understand, how do we calculate um, what our recovery is on, on, on bad inventory? Um, so let's see here. Um, so forecast intelligently. Forecasting is very hard. And it's very easy to look at, look at sort of historic numbers and say, oh, look, you know, 40% every year for the past five years, so we're going to continue growing at 40%, you know, forever. <laughs> and that hardly ever happens. The real question is, is why, why were we growing at whatever number, 40, 50, 20% before? And, and what was driving the growth, and how is that going to persist moving forward? So, for example, you know, one of, our, one of our core elements at Amazon is, is expanding selection. So every time we expand selection, we get some sort of incremental sales. It's something we never had before. We expand the sales. You know, we expand the selection. We get, you know, expanded sales. Um, the question is, is how much of our, of our revenue growth is being driven by something like that, even within a specific category or even large, you know, as we... In, for example, in Seattle right now, we have Amazon Fresh, which is a, which is a grocery, um, uh, it's a grocery internet choice where you can, you know, you can get meat and eggs and all sorts of things, and it's only in Seattle. And as that, as that business, when it started from nothing, and as we expand in Seattle, we've added more and more areas, we get incremental revenue. And that's driving some of the growth within that business. Now, every time we add more area, we're going to get incremental revenue, but what's the Within the same area, what sort of revenue are we getting, right? And what's driving that? Is it new functionality on the website? Is it new, is it new offerings uh, such as Prime or other things where we're trying to lock customers in um, uh, and provide them with, with, with a way to, to, to buy, you know, uh, to, to reduce the friction over time? Um, these, these are things where it's really hard to actually forecast intelligently. We have to take all those things into consideration. And finally, um, anticipating financial issues. This, is, this, is, uh, this means we need to get very, very close to the business uh, and really understand our business partners uh, when things are, are starting to go south. So for example, uh, one of the product groups that I support right now is toys. And toys, uh, for lack of a better explanation, is a lot like gambling. And the reason toys is like gambling is, is because for Christmas this season, most of the manufacturers have all decided what toys they're going to build. Most of the retailers have already committed to, to, to purchasing a large chunk of, of what they're going to sell during Christmas. And, and a lot of that product is new. In fact, it's never even hit the market before. I didn't say, well, I think that's going to be a hot product, and I don't like that product, so I'm not going to buy a lot. But no one really knows until we get close into the season, right? So. What we've done as a finance team is working with the business partners is, 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 is getting very close uh, to the data regarding specific toys and trying to understand and anticipate what are the early warning signs that'll, sh that'll show that a toy is about to take off and then what are the early warning signs that'll show that a toy is about to tank. And we look at a, we look at a whole lot of different things uh, to understand that. And this and we can get to grip, the sooner we can understand what trajectory we think is going to happen for specific SKUs, for specific items, the sooner that we can make better decisions and the more that we can uh, anticipate financial issues and change direction in, in an area where, you know, in a, in a, before it's too late. So, let's see here. So, the other side of business support is analytics. Um, and what I want to it sounds, 
you know, very straightforward. You have a problem. You want to figure out what the root cause is. What's very hard about doing that is, is, is um, oftentimes it's not clear. And oftentimes, the people who have the most resources to understand what the root cause is, so for example, it might be an operations team, it might be a business team, it might be the team that's actually managing, um, they'll have their own incentive structures and they're going to want to tell their own story as well. So finance has to come in, and finance is not incented either way, good or bad or whatever. Possible. And this is where finance can really, really drive value. So for example, Let's say we have a way to understand the profitability of every single sale we have. Um, and let's say over time we realize that certain, certain SKUs are serially uh, unprofitable. For whatever reason, we're just losing money. And so when you dive into it, it could be a variety of things. It could be our cost structure, the actual cost, the price that the vendor's charging us to purchase that item might be too high. It could be our supply chain pulling, you know, the, the, the item comes in and, and it, we, we, we pull it in from China, we put it into a, a fulfillment center on the, on the west coast, and for some reason never send it over to the east coast, to a fulfillment center on the east coast, for whatever reason. And then all of a sudden we just start shipping all these customer orders from the west coast to the east coast. And that can become very costly. But you have to dive into the details and really understand what's happening there. Um, so as, as a retail finance product line support finance manager, I spend a lot of time working with my teams diving into those kind of specific issues. Um, the next thing is financial bridging and variance analysis. Has, that, has anyone ever heard of bridging? Okay, we got one person. Okay, I didn't, I didn't know bridging at all when I, was in your, when I was in your shoes. But basically bridging is, is is senior management has expectations about what's going to happen. They're right here. And then all of a sudden, something else happens. And you have to bridge. You have to sit down and, and, and explain to senior management in a way that, that helps them understand what the difference is, what happened. Uh, now, it's really easy to sit down and about, you know, oh, this is what I think happened, and that's what I think happened. But what you actually do in a financial bridge is you start with your expectation, and then you quantitatively pull out the, dif the different items that'll explain the variance to what actually happened. Um, so it sounds like, you know, because it's quantitative, that you actually can definitively say why certain things are happening. And the reality is, is that in not all cases can you be definitive. And actually, if you do it in a very quantitative way, you find that you get this massive long bridge that has a lot of weird things that don't make a lot of sense. And so the real part in financial bridging that's really important for senior management is a way to, to bridge in a concise, meaningful way that'll explain all the significant business issues and be right. So I spend a lot of time trying to quantitatively say, well, we thought we were going to be here. This is what actually happened, and here's why. Here, here's, here's the actual three or four main drivers that explain the variance. It takes a lot of energy to actually do that right. So, and the next thing that, that the business support spends a lot of time doing is, is direct. Um, one of the things that finance, as I was mentioning before, is, is we can objectively analyze, and then we can also make sure that we're aligning the day-to-day -day decisions with the long-term strategy. So a classic example within the retail world are our deal buys. Deal buys are when the vendor picks up the phone. Typically, it happens three days before the end of a quarter. And they say, I've got this screaming deal for you. And then they start listing out terms. And the, the question is, is really, is this a screaming deal? Right? And, and making that decision is actually pretty hard. Um, understanding the history of the screaming deals with the vendor. Understanding um, what other, uh, what other, what, what, what is the vendor going to be saying to their competition as well? Uh, understanding what the long-term free cash flow impacts of those decisions are uh, is actually a very difficult thing. And working with your business partners and helping to create day-to-day -day processes to do that. Um, another thing that uh, 
we spend time doing is, uh, is, is looking at acquisitions, of course. Now, this isn't necessarily day-to-day -day per se, but a lot of uh, these things will roll into looking at The business team might have an idea, some, some sort of new, new business venture, but finance gets called in to objectively analyze what it, it, is that really good? Is that really complementary? Is there really the cost savings there? And one of the things that I want to step back and, and say is, is that um, depending on the organization, acquisitions uh, are often driven from a business development group or it's driven from sort of someone very close to the CFO or the CEO. And, and, and the reality is, is that, yes, there's specialty teams that look at that kind of, uh, those kind of decisions. When it's, a, when it's a big decision and uh, a lot is online, the people who have the expertise within the business, which are the, the, the business support finance teams, are the ones that get called in and actually are the ones that'll, that'll really push and make uh, some of the final analysis that'll drive the decision. The, the, the decision. So let's see here. So, so what, what, what is good finance? What makes someone a strong finance partner? So first off, the person knows the business. You have to be able to, as the business support finance person, be able to step in and run the business. In fact, you should be so good that you're, you're basically like the COO of the business. You're the chief operating officer. You need to be strong enough and respected enough by the business team to be able to do that. And at the same time, um, you're still objective, you're still one layer removed, um, even though you, you sort of feel shared responsibility and win together and lose together. So one of the things about is, is, is finance, you know, as, as kind of the, the team that'll highlight risk and, and call out issues, uh, oftentimes is, is thought of like a, as a snitch, you know, ah, you know or, 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 the, or the kid that, the boy that cries wolf. Right? You know, says, ah, we have all this problem over here. Oh, we're all going to die. We're going to go bankrupt. Ah! And, uh, <laughs> and the business goes, yeah, yeah right. And, and so the, the challenge is, 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 is being respected and having a strong enough opinion that that's not, you're, you're not just the boy that cries wolf. You're not sort of marginal, kind of, ah, he's the conservative finance guy. And he's always, you know, he's always worried about stuff. But you're, you're actually sitting at the table with the senior management team helping drive the decisions. Um, let's see here. So these are the, uh, the three I's. Um, and this is, this is one of the, 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 the true ways that you can find out if finance is strong. Uh, is Finance has to take initiative. Finance needs to be independent. And finance needs to influence. So first off, um, Finance needs to, 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 to actively seek out the agenda of finance can't, can't be set by the business team, can't be set by sort of the senior management. It's, it's actually going proactively and finding where the problems are and then doing the analysis. Even, even at the very beginning, it has to be very rough and per, you know, peripheral and saying, ah, you know, this actually could be a big problem or it's not very material. And as soon as it looks like it might be a big problem, then you start escalating. And then you start diving a deep, you know, you, you start diving in a little bit further. Um, and that's where being independent uh, becomes very important. So as you dive deep, oftentimes you're going to start pushing unpopular issues. You're going to start challenging the status quo in a way that, that makes people nervous. And, and it, as long as you're independent, people will listen and they'll listen to you and they'll know that you're actually trying to do the right thing. If you have a hidden agenda as you dive deep, and, and you, know, you, don't, you don't like that person over there, so you're just going to dive deep and make their life miserable, um, you know, you're going to lose your objectivity. You're going to lose uh, your rapport with your business partners. So even as you dive deep and independently figure out exactly what's happening, the next step is you need to step in and be able to influence the senior management and say, you know, you need to change directions. And if you highlight the issue, but don't change directions of the company, you've failed. So the, these three I's, the initiative, independence, and uh, 
influence are very important for business support. Um, so let's see here. Okay, corporate FP&A. Sounds like a... Um, and the reality is, it, is, it depends on where you are. But if you, if you run a FP&A group, it's actually a very interesting place. Because what you get to do is you get to integrate all different parts of the company. And the most important thing is you get to drive the agenda. So at a, at a company like Amazon, and most large companies, it's an incredibly complex business. And so pulling things together and actually setting the agenda uh, is a very powerful role. Um, and in fact, when I say set the agenda, I mean these are things about um, setting the actual planning and forecast process, uh, looking at the guidance, uh, the quarter end close and guidance review, and actually doing a lot of work for the presentation for the board of directors. A lot of this falls into the FP&A group. Um, and it's actually a very powerful place, a very interesting place to be. Um, and I just threw in here at the bottom, that you see the complete picture. You're actually dependent on the actual direct product line or the direct business support finance teams um, to give you a lot of the details. So in many ways, you are the finance for finance. If you go and you ask a product, a product, uh, uh, some, a business support finance team for some specific information, um, they might be busy, they might, you know, whatever, and they might throw you this big turd, and you got to say, look, that doesn't make any sense, you know? You, you got you to gotta dive in and make sure when you take that information that you understand it, you believe it, you roll it together, and then when you present it to the CEO or the CFO, it makes sense. So, let's see here. Okay, so the other functions. Um, so accounting, uh, corporate controller. So we've got accounting, controls, external audits. Field. Some of, some of you might come from an auditing background or an accounting background. Uh, it takes a lot of specialty knowledge. Um, I had no accounting background before business school. And I work a fair amount with accounting, but I am not an accountant. And, and I don't necessarily want to become an accountant. Uh, I find finance, uh, <laughs> finance is good enough for me. Um, but what I wanted to call out is, is that these, these are very specific. Most, more, more often than not, CFO. And, uh, and the CFO will end up spending a lot of time understanding to make sure that the numbers are right. Um, investor relations. Uh, so of course, uh, the SEC has a lot of requirements and the company needs to, you know, publish uh, data in accordance with those requirements. But one of the things that investor relations does is, is makes the decision about what information uh, should we provide above and beyond what's required. So, for example, the number of Kindle devices sold. That's, SC, SEC doesn't require us to provide that information. Um, but we, we will have a strategy, and the strategy will be developed by the team within investor relations on what sort of public information should we disclose about that. Now, it's a very, it's a very, um, it's a very nuanced job because what you, what you need to understand is, is of all my serious investors, um, how do I make sure that they're comfortable with the direction of the business? And what information do I want to provide them to make sure that they're comfortable? At the same time, the more information provided, the better it is for my competition. So I need to strike that balance uh, about publishing that, that information above and beyond what's required. Finally, the last thing, and this is what probably gets a lot of uh, discussion in business schools, is the actual treasury group within corporate finance. This is where we're doing cash portfolio management, foreign exchange hedging, structure, you know, calculating our weighted average cost of capital, uh, doing a lot of ad hoc credit analysis on uh, different investors, different vendors, different whatever. Um, and this is actually a very specialized feel, field as well. And most teams, most companies have a treasury team that sits very close to the CFO. It's a very small team. Uh, or they actually outsource a lot of that out to investment banking. But it's not a significant function within corporate it's a very small component of all the people working within corporate finance. 
Any questions? Okay. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, so in, in almost all cases, a certain percent of the variance will be unexplained. The question is, is, is part of the presentation is, is you know, there's, you have a customer for your bridge, and your customer is going to have expectations. And so, you know, if, if the unknown variance is, is a percent, it might not be worth calling out. If it's 30 percent, you might want to call it out. It all depends on what it's going to be used for and what the customer is looking for. Yep. Um, it's a good question. I think that that finance uh, ultimately adds, uh, in the, for lack of a better word, adds some discipline in the strategic planning process. Um, it's very easy to strategize without any numbers. Uh, it's much harder to strategize when you start putting numbers in. And I think that uh, depending on the company, companies have a lot of different ways to do planning for next year, for long-term planning, and actually what, what the strategy should be. Um, uh, finance will help drive the calendar, drive the schedule, quantify what some of those uh, strategic options might, might be uh, in an objective way. Um, so... I would say that uh, certain companies might actually have a strategic planning group uh, where they might do all of that, uh, all of their, their own calculations, which might at Amazon, Amazon's very uh, involved in all of that and finance is very involved uh, in those calculations. I think the, the goal is, is to be as objective and analytic as possible. Um, so there's a, there's a, that's a good question. There's a lot of different ways to answer that question. I think that depending on the company, um, you know, at a very small company, finance focuses almost solely on these things. They're focused on the, the controllership. They're focused on sort of the capital structure and, and the relationship with the investors in, in managing the balance sheet. And that's it. And as you grow, you start to grow into the business support roles. Um, these, these are most often functions that scale. Um, within, the, within, I mean, it depends on the corporate vision, but within, within this, the specialty areas here, um, you know, the, the controllership side is probably the one that, that will grow the most as the business expands and get bigger. You need to have more accountants. It gets more complex. There's more businesses. Um, so that's something that will grow, but the treasury side is, is a relatively specific area, a small group. Now, as far as communication goes, um, one of the advantages of finance is, is that because there's, uh, you know, because finance rolls into the, the CFO and s directly supports the business, it's much easier to communicate across a lot of businesses within finance. So, for example, I support a team uh, with on the business side that has hundreds of people, um, but there's only a few of us in finance. And so if I want to pick up and, and call someone that's over in operations finance, um, you know, it's a, it's a simple chain. I, I, in fact, worked with the people before. It's a very easy finance actually rotates around in all these different uh, operational uh, and all the business support roles. So it's very easy to communicate. Now, of course, as the company gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it becomes, becomes harder. But, but we encourage rotation within finance to, uh, to allow... Uh, uh, easier communication. Yep. <laughs> so what kind of analytics we do to look at in order to minimize?
Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I think from a financial perspective, we're very interested in, in free cash flow. And so inventory investment is one part, it's just one element of the free cash flow. And one of the other things, you know, if just as an example, if a vendor's willing to give you a 50% discount to buy a year of inventory, I mean, if your WAC is anything lower than 50%, you're like, oh, I'll do that, you know? Um, now, there's, there's some other things you need to consider. So one of the things, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but within finance, sometimes the, the capacity planning rolls into the, fi the financial org. And so your inventory investment will significantly impact uh, your capacity. And not only will it, uh, not only will you have to look at your fixed cost structure within your capacity, but you all also want to look at your variable costs and, and your capital expenditure and pull all that sorts of, pull all those cash flows uh, into uh, sort of the overall free cash flow when you look at that inventory investment. So we'll look at all those things. Anyone else? Okay, so let me, uh, let's see here. This is, I have three slides that have color on them. And you, these were the slides that I didn't actually make. So this is just a quick high level overview of Amazon for those of you who don't know. Um, and the reason why I wanted to do this is I'm gonna quickly after this talk about the actual corporate finance organizational structure within Amazon and some of the different roles that are there. Um, so Amazon's strategy uh, is to offer the biggest selection uh, and we strive to be the Earth's most customer centri centric company. Um, so I'm gonna go through these a little quick because we're running a little low on time. Um, has anyone ever seen Amazon's virtuous cycle? This is, uh, this is from uh, Jeff Bezos in 2001 talking about our, our core strategy and this, it summarized in a picture, is Amazon's core strategy. And the whole idea here is you offer selection, you give customers a decent experience, that'll drive traffic, it'll bring sellers to the site and you get this as, as you continue building this, you get this virtuous, positive feedback loop. At the same time, this will start growing. You can offer yourself, you can offer lower cost structure, which is lower prices, which is a better customer experience. So the whole idea, and this is Amazon's strategy, is to get this flywheel going, to leverage the company in the sense of leverage this experience, leverage our fixed cost structure, leverage the customer experience, uh, and then drive growth. So when we say customers, we have three core customer sets. So we have the uh, end consumer, which is what most everyone thinks of when they go to Amazon.com to buy a book or something. Um, we also have the sellers. So on Amazon.com, Amazon as a retailer sells as well as a whole bunch of third party merchants that sell. Um, and, and for those sellers, not only do we just let them sell on our page, but we also offer them a variety of services like fulfillment by Amazon, um, Amazon Web Store, so they can create their own website and their own web store. Uh, we also do uh, enterprise solutions uh, for large companies. Um, as an aside, I've sold a lot of my textbooks on FBA. It's a great way to sell, to get some return on the $100 textbooks. Um, and then the last customer is, uh, is the developer. So Amazon Web Services, we have a lot of our, uh, the Elastic Compute Cloud, the storage service, database service. Um, uh, these are our three uh, customers that we focus on at Amazon. Okay, so corporate finance at Amazon. So we have uh, Tom Skutak, who is our chief financial officer. Um, it's a, it's a hard last name to spell. I think I've just mastered it after four years. Um, business support. So within, Tom, within Tom's organization, we have mainly the business support, which is North American Retail Finance, that's the group I'm in, International Retail Finance, which has uh, China, UK, Germany, France, uh, let's see, Japan. Uh, and then we have merchant services, who help manage that third party seller merchant uh, group. Operations finance, which manages transportation, customer service, our fulfillment centers. Uh, Kindle finance, which is its own group that reports straight into uh, Tom. 
Uh, we also have Tech Finance, which manages a lot of the, the technical development on the website, um, as well as a lot of our technical services like the payment services. Uh, we have Web Services, which manages uh, the uh, Amazon Web Services, the cloud computing services. And then we also have Business Development, um, which is looking at new opportunities as well as some of the advertising uh, that Amazon provides. We actually sell advertising on our website, um, so that group will help manage some of that. Uh, reporting also directly into Tom Skutak is the corporate FP&A group, and, and this is what I was talking about earlier. These guys uh, roll up all of Amazon, and they drive the agenda for the planning process as well as uh, some of the board of director uh, reviews. Uh, one of the things I wanted to call out is, is that within a lot of the really big business support groups like North American Retail Finance, International Retail Finance, and Operations Finance, there is actual FP&A group. Um, those finance organizations are so large that they need their own FP&A group to roll everything up. Um, so corporate FP&A, it, it's really not just the, the FP&A group that r reports into um, Tom Skutak. It's these other FP&A groups that report directly into the... the uh, the, the vice presidents that run the finance, the, the larger finance teams. Uh, and then also in Amazon we have, reporting directly into Tom, uh, the finance operations team, investor relations, the worldwide controller, tax, tax policy, treasurer, and internal audit. So let's see. So business support. I talked a lot about some of the questions, but I wanted to list up some of the exciting things that we think about and some of the, the thought leadership that finance helps drive it at Amazon. So, for example, an, M an MBA SFA, probably a year or two out of school, did the analysis on uh, what would be for Amazon Prime. Now, Amazon Prime is a $79 service where we offer free two-day shipping uh, to for a year. And, uh, and that was, that was driven by a finance, uh, an SFA analysis. Um, another thing that we do a lot uh, is how are vendors performing. It's a very complex question, much like that inventory question, to, to, to understand uh, which vendors uh, are performing well, which vendors are not performing. It's not just a financial question. There's a lot of operational metrics as well. Um, Another classic finance question is, is what activities should we do in our fulfillment centers to reduce transportation costs? Um, just to step back, one of, the, one of the operating leverages that Amazon have within that flywheel is, is that if a customer comes in and buys two or three uh, different things at one time, to the extent that we can uh, manage that order within our fulfillment centers to come everything into one box and ship it to the customer, is a massive cost savings for us, and that's a cost savings that we can pass on to the customer and lower prices. So um, understanding what activities we should do, we might spend a lot more money within our fulfillment centers um, to lower our transportation costs is something that, that's, a, that's something that finance will help drive. Um, another thing, as, we, uh, as our website grows and our uh, Amazon web services grow, our consumption of servers increases significantly. So what is the right acquisition strategy for purchasing those servers? That's something that finance will, will drive. Um, and then finally, as we talked a little bit before, the acquisitions, what, if anything, should we pay for a startup venture? And what I wanted to show you is, is this is just a quick slide of some of the acquisitions that, that, that Amazon has done. And as you can see, it's kind of an accelerating. You know, it started pretty small, and then it really started to pick up. Um, some of these names are things you might not know. Uh, Joyo, that's our actual Amazon.cn China website. That was an acquisition. Um, Shopbop is, is high-end clothing uh, that we purchased in 2006. Uh, Zappos is a shoes and apparel internet retailer uh, that we purchased last year. And Woot is a, is a deal site. Um, of all these, I actually spend a fair amount of time with Fabric.com. Um, I, I support uh, Home and Garden, and within that group is uh, Fabric.com. It's a unique website that um, you, can, you can buy fabric, and they'll actually custom cut the quantity of fabric you'd like to buy and send it to you.
Okay, so here's uh, um, the typical career progression, and this is very much like my career progression at Amazon. Um, you come in as a senior financial analyst, um, and what you do at that, you, you're, you're an individual contributor, you don't have anyone reporting into you, and, and you're expected to, to dive deep and to be the subject matter expert in whatever area that you've been assigned to. Um, typically, you're part of a team, and so your, your, business, uh, your, your business support, the, the teams that you support is, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it's part of a larger team, so you might be one function within that team. Um, Next, move up to a finance manager. That's the first promotion. Uh, this is where you start to manage one to three people. You could continue to be an individual contributor, but the idea here is to, to step up. Um, and your, your, your responsibilities tend to broaden out at this point. Um, one of the things that, one of the big transition is, is typically you become the point of contact for a specific business support role. And what that means organizationally is that you end up interacting a lot with, on the business side, someone who might be a director um, or a few directors. Uh, the next step is, is to move up to senior finance manager, and that's what I am right now. You manage one to 10 people. I think I have about six right now. Um, you have much broader responsibilities, and you're expected to drive performance within your organization um, as well as outside your organization. So not only am I expected to manage my team and then make sure that the businesses that I'm supporting are doing well, I'm expected to, to um, make sure that the finance groups around me that I impact in, 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 the, in the very large scale are also um, performing well. Uh, at this level, uh, I actually directly support a vice president. Um, and I don't know how many directors I support now, maybe six or seven. Um, but one of the interesting things that I wanted to call out about corporate finance in general is that um, you, from a, very, from a very early point, start supporting senior management very quickly. It's a, it's a highly visible role. And if you join, if you go in general management and join in the business side, you're typically a cog in a big, in a big machine. And you actually don't have a lot of visibility, whereas finance because we're a support team for the senior management, we get a lot of visibility. So in my current position, I support people who are several levels above me, and I get to go regularly talk to them and, and, and debate strategy and present analyses and, and drive the strategic conversation, which is exciting as someone who only graduated from business school four years ago. Question? So it's much more the latter than the former. I mean, this is the structure. Now, the rate at which that happens is highly dependent on your performance. Um, sure. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to, I think, uh, some of, some of the things that I've done is, is to really contribute to the strategic decisions of the teams that I've been supporting. Um, and so being very relevant, and I think, you know, I mean, without sounding cheesy, if we go back to, you know, you know the three eyes and, and being objective, and um, I, those are the things that I focused on. Um, and that, those are the things that I, I've, I've strived to do. Uh, one of the hardest things at a company like Amazon uh, in, a, in a role like mine is, is, is prior, prioritization. So there's opportunity everywhere, right? And it's very easy to go down a rat hole and, and to, to, to pick something that's actually not super material in the big, in the big scheme of things. Um, so it's very important to, to figure out of, of the 100 opportunities that I can actually think of, what are the five that'll drive the most value? Um, and that's, that's, that's a highly iterative process. I mean, I think that, that Rick was talking about, uh, when he was talking about the case competition at Lehman, I think he said, you know, Tepper tends to focus on the numbers. And other schools tend to pull, you know, pull back and look at the big picture. My experience is you have to iterate between those incredibly quickly. And you have to be really good at diving deep uh, and then giving, you know, giving up if it's not worth it. It's like, ah, it's probably not a big opportunity, and then move on. So it's, it's, it's pri pr rapid prioritization, doing it right, 
and reprioritizing pretty regularly. But once, once you do that, then you figure out what's important, and then you have to focus on the, those business, uh, the business support uh, roles that make finance strong. You have to focus on being independent, taking initiative, and influencing. Like, those are the, really the core things to being successful. Okay, so what does a career in corporate finance look like? Um, so first off, there's, there's basically three broad areas. One is, is the CFO route. If you want to be a CFO, uh, clearly you have to be in corporate finance. Right? It's a CFO, right? It goes without saying. Um, but, but a CFO has a very wide breadth of experience. Uh, and the CFO's done business support. They've done FP&A. They've done controllership. They've done investor relations. They've done all this stuff. And it's important to rotate through all those things if you want to become a CFO. Um, one of, the, one of the, the, the more important things that I've called out here is, is depending on the size of the company that you want to go to, uh, you should have experience in that, that capital stage. So if you're in a, a company that's already public, uh, you, know, you, you should have experience within a company that's already public. Um, if you want to go into a startup that wants to go public, it's very important to be part of that at some point in your career so you understand what that means. And you could do that from an investment banking side. You could do that from, uh, you know, just uh, from working within the corporate finance organization of a company that went public. Um, the next route is, is to specialize with, you know, treasury accounting and controlling. And my guess is, is that as an MBA that these things probably aren't the things that you'll focus on. If anything, it'll be treasury, and that'll be if you go into investment banking and really understand how to manage the balance sheet uh, and sell a, lot of management, uh, sell a lot of management of managing the balance sheet to corporations, then that would be a good place to go. Um, the thing that typically happens, though, is people transfer to the business. If you remember what I was talking about before, strong finance business support is like a COO. It's, they're like the chief operating officer. Ultimately, they could step into the business. Then that's what we look for in a strong finance person. Ultimately, that's what ends up happening. <laughs> so what I wanted to show you, and I, I didn't want to throw in any names here, but here's currently, right now, these are all the positions that are filled by ex-finance people at Amazon. Uh, and they're pretty high up. I mean, there's a whole bunch of VPs there and directors. Um, and the reality is, is that these were strong finance uh, support staff, the businesses really liked them. When the opportunity presented, it was like, that's an easy decision. I want that guy. Um, and all these, all these people made the decision to move over. Um, so the, there's the last VP in there, VP of Home Toys, Sports, and Tools, he's, he's, uh, he's my business partner right now. And he ran... Uh, all of North America and international retail finance before he rotated into that position. Uh, it makes uh, debating finance interesting because he knows a lot. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, uh, he also is no longer a finance guy, so I still need to, to, to help him and help drive his business. Yeah? Uh, it's, it varies. You mean like these positions? Um, yeah, it varies widely. I mean, some of these people have been at Amazon for a long time. Some not so long. It's it's back back to the original back to the the, the how did you know how does someone get promoted? It's about meritocracy, and if you have the skills, uh, people will you know your performance reviews will show that, and and you know we you'll get to move into some of those positions. I'm sorry, without, <laughs> without giving a specific timeline, it's hard to... Yep. Yeah, I mean, if the positions are filled, there's no opportunity. Uh, one of the advantages of going to a, to, uh, going to a growing company is, is that opening. new positions are opening. So as you decide about what companies you want to go to, a mature industry, typically, it's just the, the number of new positions are much smaller. And so you, it's, it's attrition or someone gets promoted or, or whatever. 
Whereas is it with a growing company, there's just new positions all over the place. I mean, some of these, I don't know off the top of my head, but some of these, uh, a bunch of these actually didn't exist a few years ago. Um, so there's a lot of transition out and in as well. I mean, we hire, we hire a lot from the MBA program as well as, you know, just regular hires. Um, I think, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a personal decision for everyone. It's a career decision. And, and I mean, I think as, a, as an alumni, I would recommend uh, uh, doing something that's broad enough that you can do at another company. When you, when you start to get very specific and, and, and it's a niche that only, uh, you can only do at that company, then you start to have problems. Um, yeah. Anything else? Okay, so my next slide was, uh, this, these are two Tepper grads uh, who have actually transitioned into business. Oscar was from the class of 2005, a year ahead of me. Started media finance, uh, then uh, then media finance supported video games. Video games came and uh, and asked him to run half the business. He ran half the business for a few years and just managed. Uh, just transitioned over to uh, Kindle to manage content at Kindle. Um, he's been here uh, several times to uh, to recruit. And then uh, Din Dinesh. Uh, Dinesh Kalan uh, graduated a year after me, and he was uh, he was actually soft, uh, software finance for the software team, uh, and then actually transitioned over I think about a year and a half ago to managing their supply chain. We, that's a t it's kind of a technical word in stock management at Amazon. What what it really means is is managing the flow of goods and the relationship with our vendors so that we can flow goods into our warehouse in an efficient way. Okay, so we're about at the end. This is uh, just, just a summary of what we've been talking about. But within corporate finance, there's the business support, there's corporate FP&A, and then there's the specialty functions. And then for long-term career options, um, it's, it's the CFO route, specialize or transfer into the business. Uh, and then, you know, I had to have my plug in here, but it's, I think that finance is a very exciting place to be. Uh, one of the reasons is, is you can drive, if you can find a company that respects and uses finance effectively, you can drive significant strategic decisions at the company. Um, and you get a lot of senior management visibility straight out of business school, which is, which is, a, which is a great opportunity. Um, and Amazon is, is, that's exactly what we're doing at Amazon, so. Any, any uh, this is my last slide, any, any questions? All right, so I think uh, we're going to have a, uh, an alumni panel where I'll sit on that uh, in an hour, and you can uh, come up with harder questions and ask me then. We have, we have the ability to provide some opportunities for you guys to get connected with folks like, like Mr. Early. Um, and you know, we're going to be here on campus to help you guys. So you know, most of the battle, a lot of the battle is showing up. Um, so I just uh, want to make sure you guys sign the sign-up sheet in the back if you haven't already. We'll pass one more around this afternoon after lunch. Um, so appreciate you guys coming this morning. We'll have lunch upstairs. Um, same place as breakfast. And we'll see you back here about 1.25. Ah, I hope it, I hope it wasn't uh, too boring.
no. As you notice, the only the only slides with color were the ones that marketing them. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's, I, have, I have the same problem with slides. <laughs> I'm not too big on color. I, I, you know, it's more about the message for me. But I, I think um, it, presentation fit in perfectly with what we've done in the last last Ho day. Hopefully, the that there hasn't been much talk about that sort of the career path stuff. I mean, that, that was where I sort of went out on the ledge. Yeah, that, that, that was great. I mean, okay. that's, you know, cool. that's, that's what uh, Professor Green uh, talked about, some opportunities and mm -hmm. kind of teed up why Philip Canadians mm -hmm. is interesting. That's why you got so many fans.